Welcome to Rooted and Unwavering, a podcast and radio show which features leaders from all walks of life in conversations about courageous connectedness. How do we stay connected to our best selves, especially when we are challenged? What becomes possible when we truly stay committed to our own and others' greatness, also when we don't feel it? Join host Hilke Faber, transformational coach, facilitator, and award-winning author of Taming Your Crocodiles, and his guests as they explore leadership greatness in today's episode of Rooted and Unwavering. Welcome to Rooted and Unwavering, broadcasting live from Business Radio X, Phoenix, Arizona, where we help leaders connect more deeply to their innate potential. This is the 20th episode of Rooted and Unwavering. I'm your host, Hilke Farber, and I'm here today with my colleague, Rick Gates. How are you today, Rick? Good. Excited to be here with you today. Oh, me too. Me too. So in this episode, we're going to review the previous six episodes of Ruta and Wavering. And a little bit of a context about that. This whole series is intended to help us connect more deeply to what's true about us. And I find it so helpful myself to listen to stories from others, to nudge me back and say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is what's true about you. This is actually what you are and all this other stuff that you thought about yourself may not be it. And, and then how can you lead and live from that place? So we had six wonderful human beings and leaders in the studio over the last few months. Um, Augusto Munch, who was the president of Beringer Ingelheim and also a coach, a president of Beringer Ingelheim in Central America. Uh, we had Karen Nowicki, the leader of Business Radio X and also a trauma coach. We had Yarina and Olena, uh, and I am uh, and from, from Ukraine, speaking about their experience, uh, what it was like to be there when the war started and learning from that. Uh, we talked to Bert van der Hoek, who was the uh, president of the Trimbus Institute in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, we talked to... Uh, other people. Who else did we talk to, Rick? Valerie. Valerie Bimo from the Gates Foundation. Uh, she is a deputy director in emergency relief. And, yeah. and Gaurav Bhatnagar from Co-Creation Partners, uh, who helped each of us, each of us helped them to, to, to provide a bigger view. I think those were the six people that we talked to, or the seven people we talked to. Yeah. Did we miss anybody? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So there you go. So that's what we're going to be looking at. And, and so as Rick and I have been looking at these conversations and as we've been thinking about connectedness in general, we found there's sort of three principles that come back over and over when you think about what is it like to be truly connected? What is it like to be truly connected to ourselves and each other? And these three principles are three little words that you, I can be with a lifetime, I'm sure, and, and find more out about myself and others, which is truth, love, and service. Truth, what's really true about this? Is this thought true? What is true about me? What is true about you? Do I need all this? What is, what is true about me? Uh, love, uh, well, how do I extend what I am to others? How can I be empathetic? Uh, how do I connect to it from a deeper place to myself and others? And how do I lead from that place? And then it's not just staying in this little bubble. It's also putting this to work. Just like a tree provides shade and a flower provides beauty and for, uh, pollen for insects. Um, there's an element of service in us that brings us alive. So these are three orienting principles that we'll be practicing. So we would like to share this with you today a bit more. And I invite you as you listen to think more about what is it like for you to be more connected to yourself and to others and what happens when you disconnect. So, so having said all of that, Rick, can you share a bit more about what were some of your insights as you were listening to those seven wonderful leaders. I'd actually love to start with an experience that just happened as we just before the, the show started, we did a pause and, 
and a sort of check in as as we often do. And in the pause and in the silence we took for a couple minutes, I felt myself suddenly feeling kind of a weight of responsibility. I have so much respect. Kind of each of the people were kind of coming through my mind just as as you talked through it, Hilka. They were they were coming through my mind, and I was feeling the sort of weight of responsibility. I have so much respect for each of these people and and what they shared. And I, it was so profound. And it's like, oh, I just want to make sure I do justice to this. And and I could feel myself kind of moving into that space of, oh, I've got to do a good job here. Uh, and then almost immediately, I felt I felt kind of I felt them all surround me and begin to chuckle and laugh at me, um, you know, and, and, and say, you know, actually, Rick, that's not the point at all. <laughs> you know, open and just just to have fun with it and uh, and be playful with it. And, and uh, that's a part of why they were such inspiring people was they all dealt with challenging things and they shared openly on authentically about their experience. Oh, we forgot James um, Christensen. Uh, also, who and it, it's uh, such profound ways in which they navigated challenging experiences in their lives, and um, it, it was re it really was inspiring to go back and review and and spend time on them, and lovely to think about it in the context of those principles. Yes. Um, thinking about truth, I just you could go through each one of them. Each one of them had insights into how they focused on their truth. Uh, each one of them had some focus on how they opened their heart and how they embraced what was possible and 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 connected with others and and each of them has significant service in the world. That was just really fun to apply that that perspective across all of them and to to kind of feel them chuckling at me as I was getting myself a little bit wound up in a knot just before we started this. Yeah, and this wound up in knotness. No, but I recognize that, and I'm sure everyone listening has this experience of like, oh, you know, I'm I have to do this thing, I have to have this meeting, I am going to give this feedback, I have this conflict, I have to get this presentation, I have to write this email, and there's like sense of almost a, a preordained notness, knottedness, like now I have to be stressed out, and that that's where the first principle comes in. Is that true? Is that true? And who would you be without that thought? And what I find is, I just took a walk before this podcast. And, you know, I was in my email before this podcast and I was thinking, you know, I have to do this and this and that. And then I looked at the blossoms of the trees in my neighborhood here in Arizona. And I was like, oh, how much many more days are you going to be run around and not notice the blossoms? You know, are you going to wait for the perfect moment or like some perfect vacation or whatever it is? Or are you going to allow yourself to be here and, and experience this incredible beauty that you're in every moment? And that's part of being more connected to appreciate what is here, to, 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 to let it in and not let the ego mind delude us into all the problems we have to fix now and that we have to be so stressed out about it. You know, we all know about the reptilian brain that has repertoire, basically stress, 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 stress. And because it's such a, such a well and widely accepted distraction in our current state of evolution, we kind of all egg each other on, like, can't do this. And we associate leadership with that. And I love listening to you there, Rick, that their sense of, well, maybe that's not leadership. Maybe that's, or like an adolescent kind of leadership. Maybe there's a more mature level of leadership, which is much more being present and being able to be here and let things be what they are, open to what, what is here. These are all words, and each of us have to has to do their own work to, I think, con connect with that. I want to start our review in detail of what we heard with the person that I forgot. And James, if you're listening, I'm so sorry that I did that. Um, I was guided by my intuition and somehow I didn't mention you. And now I feel like I want to start with you uh, because what you shared, James, was so incredibly profound that I get goosebumps just thinking about it. James Christensen is the uh, CEO of Gateway Bank in uh, Mesa. It's one of the most thriving institutions uh, in community banking and in today's world, that means even more. Uh, 
And James, just in this, in this podcast, the first time I met him was just before the podcast, shared about his suicidal ideation. And um, I don't know how many people have that, but that's like an extreme form of stress, you could say, where the world becomes very, very small. So I want to read to you a little bit of what, what he said and also what we can learn from being in that state. And, you know, like er, little stress is maybe like a, an early state into that. But when we on suicidal ideation, it's like saying, you know, there's nothing to live for. James said, I found suicide to be a welcome exit. I was grateful that I had that exit. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just saying that, wow, I... That there's nothing else I could see. And so what James was saying was this. Well, it was a Sunday morning. And that's when I kind of hit rock bottom. And I had figured out how to end it, what I was going to do, right before I was going to leave the house. My wife walked in. And I was thinking, I was sitting in the closet. And my wife came in. And I was sitting there and I looked at her and I just completely broke down. And my wife's first thought was, oh, did I cheat on her? And I said, no, it's not like that. I was going through a lot of emotions. I felt shame. And I knew then what I was getting ready to do and just seeing her. I broke down and I literally fell to the floor in the closet and I couldn't stop sobbing. And she's like, tell me what is going on? And I did. And then she's like, you know, we'll figure this out. And they did. So when I listened to that story, right? That may seem for some of us very far-fetched. And for some of us, it actually may be like our experience. I know that my mind takes me into those very dark places. And when I look at James' story here, like being in the closet, literally ready to end his life walking out of the house, there was something that happened with him when he saw his wife. And I associate that with greater truth. Like something in him opens like, ah, oh, okay. And he broke down. And that to me is a very profound experience that the sense of breaking down, like there's something in us we've been holding on so tightly. Sometimes it's a belief or whatever it is. And then something lets go and a, a greater wisdom comes in. And it sometimes involves sobbing or crying, or maybe it's like, <sighs> almost a sense of relief. So that struck me as I listened to, to James. And I'm very grateful that he shared that. And he shared that openly. And then these days, he, he still has moments that are difficult, but he's able to, like he said, like take the, take the balcony perspective. And he listens to hip hop, you know, <laughs> puts music on, meditates, being, being, being very intentional about this. So Rick, as you're listening to that story, what strikes you? Well, there's several things that strike me. Um, I can remember a period in my life when, when I wasn't sure I wanted to live. And I didn't get quite to the point of having a specific plan and, 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 and a timing, but I was frequently in that desperation of I see no way forward through this to take care of the people I love and care about other than die and leave them with an inheritance because um, I'm not helping them being here uh, and and that was a very scary time and 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 it wasn't as dramatic as what James talked about the sort of falling to the floor but that really was the experience it ended up being a uh, an unplanned break from work and uh sabbatical in which I uh, really just kind of opened up and said, all right, this isn't working. What, what do I want instead? Mm -hmm. And over the period of a couple months, having the time and, and the spaciousness to be able to 
find some new purpose and some new sense of of what I wanted to do and and deal with some health things in my life that were that were impacting me. I wasn't sleeping well, and the, the cumulative effect of not sleeping well was impacting my psyche, and and I was in depression, and I needed medication to help me through that at that point in time. Um, so there is a kind of broken open. I think that was one of the books by Elizabeth Lesser that I read in that time, Broken Open. Uh, and there is something really profound about that experience. There's a, a breaking point, uh, you know, the the rock bottom, the many ways people talk about it, where we find that sort of truth. We find that bedrock. We find, okay, what is it that really is most important? Yeah. Uh, and from there, then we can rise. From yeah. there, then uh, something becomes possible. So it is a kind of coming to a truth. And I remember James also talking about how then going forward in the experience of coping with, uh, with his situation, the, the strangers that loved him hmm. uh, and, and how he could take in their love and let it begin to help him begin to love himself more. Hmm. Um, and, and I thought that was a really profound and opening way. So there is a kind of a, of a finding our footing in the truth and an opening to, um, to the love that shows up when we do that. Mm. For me, that love showed up in the form of people. It showed up in the form of, um, I just felt like I felt totally guided that I masterfully, you know, each book I found built on the last one and helps me move through a journey that opened me up and helped me see a path forward and, and led me to a sense of purpose and service that, that has sustained me for the last 20 years. Mm. I love that sense of broken open is being broken open like we can't break ourselves open and yet there's a choice in it as well um, so when i think of the parallels between your story and james's story and then augusto's story um, it, it's remarkable like augusto very accomplished you know ceo of a region of Beringer Ingelheim. He's been in this company for 25 plus years, I believe, or 23 years. And he describes this experience of going to Germany headquarters and having to do some kind of presentation to the board or whatever it is, and him having something close to a heart attack. And then the doctors diagnosing and doing all this. And, and then he said that they didn't find anything Besides, there was an area that was irritated that had all everything to do with stress. And his doctor asked him, so do you have any particular kind of stress that's ongoing for you? And he looked at it and he's like, yeah. And he realized he was very overcome by the fear of not do being enough and being abandoned and being rejected. And that was keeping him like in this crunch in this like small bubble and interestingly he then later on shared in the podcast that he now has this mantra that he reminds himself by of by having this bracelet on his on his wrist which reminds him to be humble and reminds him to not fall into the trap of his ego his ego being just the idea we have of ourselves that we have to defend at all costs. Like I have to please the board or I have to be this performer. Like you said before this podcast, I have to do justice to all these people, you know, or me, like I have to get through all these emails and be a successful entrepreneur and all this stuff that I have to do. Otherwise, ah, oh, something like, oh, look at the blossoms, right? Look at the bracelet, look at your wife. And then, then stuff starts to open up. I sometimes find that um, getting a hug gets me out of that or eating some good food. It's like, it's like an other senses, part of the senses gets activated. What Augusto's mantra was, is, is that I, self, ego, is smaller than it or it is bigger than me, right? But the true me is bigger than it, right? I am smaller than it, but the true me is bigger than it, whatever the challenge is. And he 
made this very concrete. And he said, you know, our mind thinks it's like me against the world. But then when I start to see that I'm part of a community, of a country, of the world, of the universe, and I just start seeing this big piece, this whole history, he talked about how Birger Ingelheim has been around for many decades. And one person is not going to make or break the difference. Of course, there's some extreme examples where that is not the case, but you can see the sense of like the sense of wholeness. So this sense of surrendering to something bigger. And of course, the surrendering happens from the place of clenching. Like I'm clenched, I'm clenched. So now I need to surrender. And that's one part of what I, I learned from, from, from Augusto. So Bert, uh, Rick, had something similar to say about that. Maybe you can share a little bit about what your, your thinking was when you heard Bert speaking about how he was serving more broadly uh, through, like, through his life, starting from like me <laughs> to, ah, it's not about me or whatever struck you from that conversation? Well, I, what the, the part that struck me from that was slightly different. Um, Great. But I, but I think it connects. Um, it was the, the letting go of anyone needing to be wrong or right ah. um, that opened things. And it was that, that creating um, a, a deeper ability to see the truth of the situation, to see himself, to see others more clearly. Um, and, and that opening a space to the finding common purpose, hmm. theme, which I found so powerful in what he shared. Uh, hmm. And that actually triggered for me a memory of there was a, a teacher I had in high school who used to talk about finding friends as finding common purpose. Hmm. Well, they met and they found common purpose. And what he meant by that was they met and became, they met and became friends. Hmm. And that idea of friendship, of that connectedness being formed by finding common purpose, I thought was uh, was powerful. It sounds like that's slightly different than what you were remembering. So maybe share a little bit what you were what you were remembering mm -hmm. from what he was sharing that that connected to there. And I love that you and I are practicing connectedness right now because I realized that I had an idea of what it should be, which is disconnecting me from you. <laughs> Uh, and and part of being connected real, realize is that we each have different perspectives on truth. So your perspective on what you saw was something, and then I had something else. So with Bert, somewhat similar, part of connected leadership, the way he talked about it, was that two things. One, that in his life, he said there's kind of this natural evolution. Like we start off thinking it's all about me. I have to be successful. Like it's, it's like a small bubble. And then it became, he said, at some point he said, my guitar to his fiance at the time, my, my guitar is more important than you. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he changed his perspective on that at some point. And then it's just your family and then it's your team and, and, uh, or in, on, in whatever sequence it is for you. And then, and then at some point it's not about my team, but now he's like, the head of Trimbos, which is the National Institute for um, Well-Being and, and he, in the Netherlands. Now he's thinking about how can I make a space or, or contribute to a space where everybody's well-being is, is served. And what I thought was very powerful in that conversation with him was he talked about what in my mind are two arts rivals. Uh, hospitals or healthcare providers and insurance companies. And don't get me started on those things, like from my own personal perspective. But what he said about that was very interesting. He said, you know, I've been both a CEO of both parts. Like I've been a CEO of a healthcare provider and an insurance company. And I know what both parties care about. They do care about providing sustainable care and the longevity of their organizations when it comes down to it. When I get out of the rat race of I have to be maximizing profit and all this stuff, that in the end, everybody agrees doesn't matter. And he said, when you create a safe space 
where people are able to come down from their high horse positions and start to sink more deeply into what they truly care about. Then you have dialogue and you come up with solutions together. So that to me is practicing truth together and also extending love and respect to each other. So that's, a, that's another element of connectedness and also embodying service, asking ourselves, what are we really here to do? Like, what is it that we really here to do? Look, when you're talking about broken open, what, what came up for me was the uh, experience of Olena and Irina in, uh, in Ukraine. And it was so beautiful that you had the conversation with them right around the anniversary of the invasion. And they were, they were sharing their, their, you know, vivid, real experience of that whole process, uh, each of them from a slightly different perspective. But um, that sort of life crisis opens and clarifies and, and makes it really easy to see what's most important. And so many things that we that we clench about fall away. Um, sort of struck with that image of of James falling to the floor, and and how that uh, threads its way through several of these conversations. There's a kind of everything falls to the floor in the face of an invasion, in the face of everything being threatened. Um, where there's a, a a coming to this is what's really important. Now what do I do? And and a a kind of finding our courage in that in that moment, both the feeling immobilized um, and then the f- moving from immobilized into okay, but now I need to take action. I need to do something. I need to move forward from this, and and having that sort of clarification and uh, and and orientation made solid and and clear and vivid for them. Uh, it was just really compelling to hear their story and, uh, and, and how that impacted them. Would love to hear your, your perceptions as you think back on that conversation with them. Yeah, this sense of stepping into what is needed now. And they were both very honest. Like when the full scale invasion started, their reactions were somewhat similar, like, oh, Uh, oh no Um, and each person had a different response and what was so beautiful about them is that they both deeply respected the other so Olena Sergeyeva left Ukraine a couple of weeks before the full scale invasion started she had an intuition and she followed it and she felt that this is what she had to do so she left and she chose to be of service to herself and to her country and family from that place, right? Yarina stayed and she describes her process of having COVID at the time already and feeling immobilized. And then after a while, getting very clear about what is needed now, what is needed now, what, how do I serve from this place? And she said, I am not the person that's going to go to the front. That's not me. But my gift is communication and PR. And that's how I'm putting myself to service. So each of those two people having a very different response to simply something similar, both living truth and both respecting each other. And to me, that was actually quite healing to hear that, that those kind of different actions can coexist and deeply respect each other. And there's a harmony between that as opposed to some kind of recipe of when war happens, heroism looks like this. And if you're not doing that, you're a failure. And neither of them was like following that recipe. There's much more openness in that, that happened. And that, that to me is also living truth. Yeah. Think of it. Maybe it's finding what's mine to do. Yes. What's mine to do now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we can translate that into meetings, right? We may have a, uh, read a book about what is it like to be a good team member. And then we see a team member always speaking up or having the really profound insights or driving the agenda or whatever, or listening very deeply. And we think, oh, I have to be, uh, and now I have to follow a recipe as opposed to, no, I need to find my own place in this. 
And that to me is part of the invitation that we have as human beings and as leaders to re really listen deeply, as you said beautifully, Rick, to let the clutter like calm down and, um, and then we can connect more deeply to what's true. Wow, this conversation is going fast. We're already at the half hour point. <laughs> so we're gonna take a break in a, in a moment. After the break, we're going to explore more deeply also what we can learn from some of the others uh, from the conversations we've had. Um, I'm thinking, for example, about Karen and the wiki talking so powerfully about what it's like to work with emotions because this, this breaking open, this allowing ourselves to lead from truth is in, can be very intense work. You know, our emotional systems can produce all kinds of things. And how can we be with that with courage and with a lot of presence? And how can we learn from that? So let's explore that more after the break. We've been, you've been listening to Root and Unwavering, uh, where we've been, you're Rick and I, Rick H and I have been talking about reviewing the last six podcasts. See you after the break. You are listening to Rooted and Unwavering, presented by Growth Leaders Network, the leadership, team, and culture development company. If you would like to learn more about working on connectedness for yourself, your team, or organization, please contact Growth Leaders Network on LinkedIn. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to Root and Wavering. We've been talking about the last six podcasts and what we can learn from it. And one of the themes that struck me is just let it be broken open. You know? And when I think about all the information we're getting, like six podcasts is a lot of information. I'm thinking about all the information we get every day. The mind wants to understand it all which creates more separation. And from the heart, we can just be in it and not be in a rush to understand it all, cover it all. Um, but we just, like you said, Rick, earlier, we take what's ours to do. Yeah. So there's three people uh, that we haven't talked about yet. Gorov, um, Karen and Valerie and Valerie and let's explore those three conversations when you think about those three what stands out for you Rick well something that each of them brought that I thought was so helpful and, and Garov talked about it uh, quite a bit was the the ability to see themselves to watch themselves in the process um, but but each of them, uh, you know, showed it. Karen showed it in in observing the way she was going through something and the way she was uh, talking about it with others, and even talking with us about it in the in the course of the podcast. Um, Valerie talked about her beautiful work with uh, with people in crisis situations and and observing the way they're at their functioning and then observing also how it, how the experience was for her and how much she was taking away from it. So I think each of these three and, and actually all of the, all of the folks. And I think part of the reason it feels like it's so much of it, because I, I just went through and counted it's actually seven podcasts. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's such a rich tapestry. Um, that that all of these folks brought. And in fact, this is a kind of out of left field, but one of the things that came up for me as I was thinking about this this morning is my sister is a quilter. Um, and, and she's been making a quilt out of some fabric that was made from photos taken by an astronaut who lived quite a while on the uh, space station, the International Space Station. Beautiful images of what the Earth looks like from space. Um, and it, it's such a powerful sense of perspective that when you pull back, you see something that you couldn't see when you were when you were so close and right in it. So I think a part of this sort of falling down, breaking open is that we also pull back from it and can see it more broadly 
uh, and 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 see what's there and what we can learn from it and and what we can take forward. Taking a step back. Yeah, I'm struck with how revolutionary that is. You know, because the from what most of us, I believe, at least me, is more familiar with, is the staying in it not taking a step back, you know, being so in it that we forget. And you could say disconnecting is just forgetfulness. It's forgetfulness of what we are. Um, and when we reconnect with that, there's such beauty that opens up and it's an endless journey. And I love the tapestry from space. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me that even also the things we say are all little grains of sand, you know, the little spots in, in, in the hole. And that's also what Gaurav talked about. Like he's, he, I, I had a very, made a very profound and provocative statement. He said, if you're exhausted, it means that you're disconnected from the infinite self that you are. And I don't think he meant physically tired, I think he meant, at least how I heard it, um, emotionally drained, like burnt out. And I, I can relate to that because there's, there's a lovely thing about really engaging in the task. It's really wonderful. It's very, very fulfilling. And then there is just getting lost in that and forgetting the bigger part and becoming so identified with the task that um, that the well-being leaves. And I really got that from, from, from what Gaurav said. It's like, oh, you know, to see yourself and see what's see that we're all parts of this infinite consciousness and that we're all egos uh, giving ma manifestations to that. He talked about his life story as being unhappily successful before he discovered this work. And then working in South Africa, in Johannesburg, I think it was, in the McKinsey office. And then there's some lady that came in called Gita Ballon, who he thought was crazy at the beginning. And then he did some meditation. And then he had this Kundalini life force experience. And then he's decided to dedicate his life to that and now coaches people and all around the world. I see that very much connected to the sense, the truth of being broken open. I was like, ah, now I'm connected to something much deeper. And I think that's part of our role as a leader to allow, allow ourselves to break open to that bigger energy and to inspire others to do this, do this. We call this, I think, in the management literature, psychological safety, you know, where people are able to share freely what, what is going on. So what struck you from the case conversation with Karen, Rick? You know, I think what struck me from the conversation with Karen was Karen. <laughs> um, you know, it's 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 a how she is in the world, uh -huh. and the sort of willingness to be open and uh, authentic and present uh, that that really struck me. That it I, I, I it was in, it was inspiring to me. It's like, oh, I want to be more like that. I felt I felt very called forward um, by her and just the way that she was sharing and how she was showing up. How about for you? Yes, and I liked the articulation she had because he challenged me at some point because I said to her, you know, when you're stressed, you're kind of getting very lost in yourself. And she said, no, 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 no. Actually, when you get stressed and triggered, you leave yourself. And the, the, the job is to come back to yourself. And I loved how she was talking about this. Like, and we all have these experiences. We're getting, getting stressed, triggered or whatever, and getting very much in it. And, and she actually, Karen talked very vulnerably, vulnerably about a breakup that she just had gone through, where she thought she was going to marry this person after not having dated for a long time, after a very mm, traumatic divorce, and she's like, nah, never again. And she starts dating. She met, meets this person. They are together. And after a couple of months, they think she thinks it's going to 
result into a lifelong partnership, marriage, and then there suddenly is a break. And she described her own process with so much vulnerability. And what I was struck by is what you're saying, Rick, is she took the step back, you know, didn't get lost in all the kerfuffle of the emotions and the expectations, and all, but she took a step back and she let the insight happen and she let it clear and she was willing to, to, to stay in her body and she, just, she was willing to stay with the emotions and really look at them without getting lost in them, which I thought was another beautiful thing about what she taught about that emotions are not garbage, but they have some information, you know, and she, she's, I think she shared something about that when she let go of the expectation of what should happen, there was this love towards this other person that's still here. And now they're really good friends, you know, so to allowing things to be what they are and not get in the way of that. Um, and she does that with her uh, clients or in her trauma guiding pr uh, practice. She, she mentioned a, 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 an example of a board member calling her in the morning in tears. And she said, you know, what I did was I just was with her. And to me, that was very profound, that simple, like the simply being with, that bringing attention, that allows for the light that comes in, to come in and the insight to emerge. So that's, again, the practice of truth and love and service all at the same time. It connects to what you were talking about a moment ago for me, Hilko, of being there's a certain energy and joy in the task and then we get caught up in it. And, and I found myself thinking as you were saying that it isn't that we're caught up in the task. We're caught up in the story about ourselves in the task. Hmm. Because actually being in the task is like the being with, it's the sitting with. Hmm. Here I am, here's the task and I'm sitting with it. What is it teaching me? What am I get to learn from it? What are the emotions that are coming up for me? Hmm. What's, uh, what's it calling forward in me? What's it making me uncomfortable about? Hmm. That's all the sort of sitting with the, I'm not looking the way I want to look. I'm not accomplishing the way I should accomplish. All that kind of stuff is the story about it that we get so quickly tied into that we stop being with it, that we stop sitting with it. And I think just sitting with life, uh, you, you've heard me use this many times. My, my sweetheart who passed away last summer constantly had the question, what is this giving you the opportunity to feel? <laughs> And I love that question. And I hate that question. <laughs> but it is so helpful and so profound many, many times. That's the sitting with experience. What is this giving me the opportunity to feel? What's, what's this calling forward in me? How can I be helpful to this person? Yes. What am I feeling as I'm sitting with them? What am I experiencing as I'm, as I'm here watching this? And, and if we maybe focus for a minute on Valerie... I think Valerie did such a beautiful job as she described how she's in these really interesting situations. People are in crisis. They don't have food and they're passing out food. And she talked about how a woman brought back some rice that, that had been given to her because I don't need this much. And why should I have more when somebody else doesn't have what they need? That there's a, there's a, a goodness and, a, and an openness in people when they're at their core, when they're in that space of sitting with. Mm -hmm. And there's something about sitting with, whether it's in war or it's in famine or it's in crisis, there's, we're sort of forced to sit with. Mm -hmm. Here we are, all of us, in the presence of this thing that's challenging us together. We had experience of this in some ways at the beginning of COVID. There was a sense of, oh, we're all going through something together. It was a part of what I think opened us to thinking about connectedness as a topic was this mm -hmm. sort of shared experience we were all having in a disconnected way mm -hmm. um, yeah. that there's a there's a, there's an opportunity in all of that to sit with and 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 be with and and see things as they are even more clearly than we than we normally would as we're running our ego processes of how do i look and what should i do and how do i have happen what 
what I think I should be able to control and have happen here. Yeah, yeah. And that, I'm just struck by how unloving the mind can be, you know, and, but when it's not in truth, because then it, it the, the first point, port of unlove is to totally not love ourselves and, and sort of beat ourselves up for not being in the situation and not having the task done or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I'm, I'm struck by Valerie's witnessing and the strength of her witnessing. She's, she's worked in emergency response for probably decades now uh, in some way. And now works, she's been working with the Gates Foundation for a long time. And I remember this one phrase where she said, you know, it's, it all comes down to this whether I sit with Bill Gates or I sit with a person in uh, a, a hit area, like a person that doesn't have anything to eat, it's all the same. We just want to be loved. We just want to be loved and feel that we belong and, and connect to this kind of sense. And that seems so almost... Uh, wrong to say like why what is a person that doesn't have anything to eat and bill gates have in common it seems like so like almost like a spiritual bypass uh to even talk about it that way and and yet she said it that way because she lived this every day and i thought that was that really made me think uh, and and made the truth of that even come more to life when she shared the story about um this woman who had this had, had discovered had, had uh, received rice had some rice. Uh, and then this woman who didn't have much herself turned around and shared the rice with others. And then when she was asked, why'd you do this? She said, well, how can I eat when the people around me are hungry? And this, this sense of like, I, this is what I have to do. Um, and the sense of goodness in people, in each of us. So yeah, I was, I was very struck by, by that. And it, for me, takes out this monstrous ego part that I have, which is that I have to be the hero and the solution, the, the, the rescuer and have to solve it all. But I, what I felt in her was even in the midst of that, there was a sense of joy in observing and being of service. And maybe the heartbreak of never being able to solve it all, which I think is a heartbreak we all have as humans in some way, but being able to be with, you know, to, to be with, to be with that. And then there's something else that opens up that is always, which does not fit in all the images we have of what should happen. So. I'm struck as we're talking through this. It's always interesting how the themes emerge. <laughs> uh, so play with this broken open theme that we've been, been talking a little bit about. Um, the the broken part of it the the james falling to the floor the 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 falling away of the illusion of the things that aren't true the landing on the truth the sort of realities of war that that sort of broken part of it then the landing in this state of openness the being with the holding less tightly um, and, and the kind of paradox that this state of broken open, which, you know, I, I, as soon as I say that, I think of it as somebody that has been weakened mm. by the experience, someone who isn't strong then. They're, the broken open, we should be careful with them now because they're not as strong. Um, actually, that broken open is strength. Mm. That's the place from which I can do what's most important. That's the place from which I can be and bring the best of me and i think there's an element of this that's that's that that threads across all of these guests too it's a, it's a where i find myself so that that open isn't empty that open is full of me and not in an ego way but in you know in the service way in the i'm yes. full of what i'm here to be in the world yeah. I'm here to bring the the Rick flavor of openness to the world. And I spent a lot of my life trying to have my flavor of openness not have any personality. 
mm-hmm. to be somehow, you know, not have any of that because that would be mm-hmm. that would be offensive or that would be ego. And and I eventually learned in in some in some really helpful experiences that what I need to do is let it be the Rick flavor of open. Mm-hmm. Let it be my version. That's what I'm here to bring is my version of open is my mm-hmm. willingness to sit with and be and uh, that that as I am that in the world, as I live into that purpose, then um, I can can bring what I'm here to bring. That that's that's when I am powerful in the important ways, in the more mature ways. I love that sort of arc that that, that we talked about of how as a, as I get farther in life, I get more clear about what that's like, and it's not the adolescent version which needs to be in front and needs to be loud. It can be the quiet version that just needs this is this is what's mine to do. This this is what's mine to bring yeah. in that kind of open living who I'm meant to be way. Yes. I'm getting very quiet as I'm listening to you, Rick. And it strikes me as there's not a arrival point like a connected leader is no. It's, we are on this journey, this is of course an overused metaphor of greater and greater and greater openness, you know, greater and greater openness, where the journey of discovering more and more is the reward itself. Um, and what I love about this is that that's also has, is very redemptive to think about it that way, right? Because we're oft, so often taught in the world and in organizations, business to say that's right and that's wrong. Um, often when we work with organizations, we talk about it in terms of from to, from old way of being, which is often a little bit more contracted, fear. Maybe it's like fixed thinking. I have to do this by myself, blaming others, uh, you know, have to be the hero, whatever is on that, on that column. I have to be prescriptive to being much more adaptive, being inspirational to uh, working together, having a growth mindset, whatever, right? And the ego mind makes from bad and to good. And connectedness means that we are honoring each part of the journey, right? There's a, there's, there's part of, like you can't walk before you crawl. And so part of us having to be up front, if that's our experience in the adolescent stage of our maturing of our consciousness, we learn something about ourselves. There's some, something to learn about power and agency and, and our personality and all these things. You know, and I can think about that for myself. Like I still have some adolescence energy in me. Uh, and you know, part of me is very curious about the world and and joyful and at the same time a little pushy and you know i get to work with that and you know one part is to say ah it's all garbage so this you know zen be in the not zen this is like pop zen not real zen but pop zen like be in the space of being and it's all good and but there's also this Just like taking a walk. Ah, that's beautiful. Ah, there's value in that. Ah, there's value in that. And it doesn't have to all add up perfectly. So when I think about these these conversations we've had, each person shared authentically about how they're connecting more deeply to themselves. And universally, what was across them is they didn't make themselves wrong for their experience. And I think if that's something that I can take away and that we can take away from these conversations to honor our own experience. And even if we get lost in, get lost in, have that experience, right? But then saying, oh, okay. Now, how do I allow myself to evolve to the next level of being more deeply connected to what is true, what is loving, to what's being of service? And that's just being with that question can be a propeller to propel us forward without having to get to a landing place. 
that really resonates for me. It's a returning again and again to openness and even not making bad the times when I'm away. I'm forgetting. I, I, Garb talked about fear is love forgetting itself. Yes, I forget myself. I forget the openness. I forget what helps me in that state. And the very process of forgetting opens for me some things about which I can be curious that will help me be more open, stay open longer the next time. So each journey away is of value because it strengthens the journey back. Uh, so returning again and again to openness. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm thinking of of a of a guest that's not on, not been on yet, but he told me before. So we may talk about in this podcast. Like I always look every year, it's like, what am I going to fail at this year? <laughs> <laughs> And, and so how could I grow from that? And that does require intentionality, um, at least from what, the way I hold it. I think life has this way of teaching us, even if we're not willing. But if we are willing, the experience is a lot more enjoyable. I find. Yeah. So I what would you say? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. When I can remember that open feels better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> then I become less resistant to returning to open. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's easy to forget that. But more and more now I hold on to and I don't lose track of the fact, oh, I'm not open now. Open is better. Let's think about open again. <laughs> <laughs> So as we're getting to the close of this conversation, Rick, what is it that you would like, love to share as a closing thought? I love being inspired by people. That's the reason I've enjoyed the podcast so much. The, the guests have just really offered such beautiful insights into their own journey and, and uh, the power of their stories is, is really compelling and opening for me. Um, and I'll return to the little experience I had just before we started. And it becomes a dance of my, my thinking mind wants to be like them, to be worthy, to be all those things. And, and really all that falls away What's mine to do is to be the best version of me I can be today. Um, and that's really what they were doing as each of them did what I find so admirable in what they were doing. Thank you, Rick. That's beautiful. For me, it would be to allow, to enjoy the hike in humanity and to really enjoy it, to say, okay, what am I seeing now? What can I learn from this? How can I serve from this? So it's been wonderful to be with you today again, Rick, and uh, for all of us to be together in this space. If you've been listening, I hope you've heard something that made you feel maybe a little taller on the inside, a little bit more broken open um, in a week. On May 12th, we'll be speaking with Renee Smith, who is the CEO and founder of A Human Workplace, um, where the organization is actively working on having less fear and more love in the workplace. And we'll be exploring that. I'm looking forward to that conversation. Um, if you're interested in more of these kind of topics and conversations, please subscribe to this podcast, Root and Unwavering, on Spotify, Apple, and other places. You can find us on LinkedIn, Growth Leaders Network on LinkedIn. And you can connect with Rick and I on LinkedIn as well and with other colleagues. Um, and for now, I'd say have a beautiful rest of your day and uh, enjoy this hiking into being more and more broken open into what's true. See you next time. Thank you for joining us in today's episode of Rooted and Unwavering, leadership conversations about courageous connectedness, presented by the leadership development company, 
Growth Leaders Network. To learn more, subscribe to this podcast, connect with Growth Leaders Network and Hilke Faber on LinkedIn, or read Hilke's award-winning book, Taming Your Crocodiles. Now take a moment and appreciate something that is great about you. Celebrate the gift that you are and enjoy connecting more deeply to your best self today. See you next time on Rooted and Unwavering.